Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us in our Q&A session titled Preserving Mental Health and Black Mothers, Bridging the Gap Between Patients and Providers, funded by the Department of Health. My name is Evie Gonzalez. I am a perinatal mental health coordinator for the Partnership for Maternal and Child Health of Northern New Jersey, and I work in the Perinatal Mood Disorders Initiative. For those of you who are not familiar with our organization, we are a nonprofit agency that's committed to improving the health of women, children, and families. I encourage you to visit our website at www.partnershipmch.org to learn about the different programs that are available in the areas that you work in and in the areas that you live in. Before we begin with our panel discussion today, I do want to talk in a little bit of detail about my program, the Perinatal Mood Disorders Initiative. So our program is broken down into four pieces. The first piece is that we provide professional and consumer education, meaning that we go out into the community and we educate doctors, nurses, consumers, paraprofessionals about perinatal mood and anxiety disorders, as well as self-care. The second piece of our program is we do virtual support groups. Those groups run Monday through Friday at various times, and two out of those groups are Spanish speaking. The third piece of our program, which is probably one of our biggest pieces, is we have an emotional health phone support program. What this program does is it serves as a phone follow-up service for women that are pregnant, women that have a baby under the age of one, who have suffered from a perinatal loss, who've had a voluntary or involuntary abortion, and who also have given a baby up for adoption. And our goal for this program is to reach out to these moms and get them connected to mental health services in the community that they live in. And last but not least, another piece of our program is we do a lot of community events. Um, for example, tomorrow we have a virtual health fair that we're going to be doing. So what I really recommend is just go to our website, click on the tab that says virtual programs, and take a look at all the upcoming events that we have that are going to be occurring within the next few months. Okay, so now let's get started with why you're really here today. <laughs> um, so in today's discussion, we will be talking with Dr. Pooja Lakshman, Lauren Elliott, Dr. Crystal Clark, and Neka Simister about how to create a safe treatment environment for women of color. Too often, Black women tend to suffer in silence when it comes to their mental health. We as an organization recognize that is something that needs to change, which is the reason why we're having this Q&A today. So ladies, I just want to thank you so much for being here and taking time out of your busy schedule to be a panelist with us for the next hour. We really appreciate it. This is such an important topic for too long. Women of color have not been accessing mental health services for a variety of reasons, and we want to fix that. So I'm happy that today we're going to begin the conversation on how to do that. For those of you who are watching, please feel free to utilize the chat box to ask questions. We have a lot of ground to cover, but we will try and leave some time at the end to get to your questions. When inputting your questions, if possible, please put the name of the panelist you were directing your question to. All right, so let's get started. Okay, so our first speaker is Dr. Pooja Lakshman. Dr. Pooja Lakshman is a board certified psychiatrist and writer specializing in women's mental health and perinatal psychiatry and a frequent contributor to the New York Times parenting section. She is a clinical assistant professor of psychiatry at the George Washington University School of Medicine, where she is a clinical supervisor in the five trimesters perinatal psychiatry clinic. Dr. Lakshman maintains a private practice in Washington, DC, where she applies an integrative approach to taking care of women suffering from maternal mental health conditions. She is active in adv advocacy work and community building through online platforms, including her Instagram account at Women's Health Doc. Dr. Lakshman is most passionate about empowering women and sees her clinical work as a perinatal psychiatrist as an extension of that mission. Her writing appears in the New York Times, and her advice has been featured in Glamour, Marie Claire, Self, Harper's Bazaar, Bustle, and various other media outlets. 
She currently is working on a book about the tyranny of self-care. So thank you, Dr. Lakshman, for being with us for this panel. Um, so what, before we get into the specifics of, um, you know, perinatal mood and anxiety disorders and what that looks like in women of color, I think it's important as professionals to be aware of what exactly is a perinatal mood and anxiety disorder. We hear so much about baby blues and baby blues being very common. 80% of women experience that after they have a baby. But sometimes as professionals, we're not sure when does it stop being baby blues and when does it come become a perinatal mood and anxiety disorder? So can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, absolutely. And thank you so much, Evie, for having me. I'm so excited to be here with this amazing panel and, and really excited for this conversation that we're gonna have today. Um, I think that that is such a good question around the difference between a perinatal mood and anxiety disorder versus the baby blues. Um, so like you said, the baby blues is going to affect about 80% of women. It's super common um, and it's a normal experience of the postpartum period. It doesn't typically require treatment in the way that a perinatal mood or anxiety disorder would require treatment. The baby blues typically comes on around day four postpartum and is related to the big drop in estrogen that happens right after delivery. It should not last more than about three to four weeks. Um, and the baby blues, typically, you know, to my patients, I describe it as sort of an emotional roller coaster. You can mm -hmm. have a lot of irritability, you can have mood lability, ups and downs, crying spells, anger. Um, but it, over the course of three to four weeks, it should be getting better over time. It shouldn't be getting worse. It also shouldn't interfere with a mom's ability to take care of her baby versus uh, perinatal mood and anxiety disorders, which are clinical conditions that require treatment. Um, if you are after four weeks postpartum, it's no longer the baby blues. It, it's gonna be something clinical like a PMAD, like a perinatal mood or anxiety disorder. The other thing is even in that four week period where it could be the baby blues in that time period, mm -hmm. if mom is having trouble taking care of the baby, if mom is having a feeling disconnect of disconnection from the baby, that could be a sign that this could be a PMAD as opposed to the baby blues, and it's, it's worth getting an evaluation. I think that if you have a patient that's suffering from the baby blues and she's concerned about her symptoms, it's never the wrong idea to recommend that she uh, get an evaluation or speak with her OBGYN to get um, a full assessment. That's never a, a wrong move to make. Even if the OBGYN says, hey, I think we're still in the baby blues period, at least she can talk to your client about what are some of the warning signs that we need to look out for? And she'll have the patient kind of on her radar going forward. Um, so I think that that's something that you should always kind of advocate and help your patients make those empowered decisions for themselves. Wonderful, thank you. Um, one of the things that we've been seeing, especially through our emotional health phone support program is an increase in women that are suffering from anxiety, especially with everything that's going on with the pandemic. What are some techniques that you feel a professional can give a mom to help her deal with the anxiety that she's experiencing? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, you know, we know with the research coming out that, um, you know, in, the, in a typical um, non-pandemic period, the rates of perinatal mood and anxiety disorders are about 15 to 20%. But with the pandemic, we're seeing rates of anxiety as high as 70% in pregnant and postpartum moms. And we know that in women of color and black women, those numbers are gonna be even higher. So this is just, these are tools that I think all pregnant and postpartum women need. Um, one of the techniques or one of the frameworks that I really uh, like best for dealing with anxiety comes out of acceptance and commitment therapy. So some folks listening might be aware of the technique of cognitive diffusion. So cognitive diffusion is all about looking at how can you actually accept the bad feelings that you're having? How can you accept the anxiety as opposed to fighting with it or struggling with it? So a lot of my patients right now are really worried about, you know, um, what am I gonna do in the postpartum period when I don't have as much support? Or what am I gonna do if my toddler is homesick from school and I have my newborn, how am I gonna be able to function? taking care of everybody. So it's a lot of these kind of ruminative worries that don't necessarily have a solution. So what cognitive diffusion teaches is instead of 
trying to disprove your anxiety or instead of kind of engaging with it and trying to talk yourself out of it. Because we all know that when you're feeling anxious, you can't just mm -hmm. talk yourself out of it. So it doesn't really yeah. work. In instead of, it's more of a mindfulness technique. It's more kind of looking at, let me be an observer of my anxiety. I can watch my thoughts. I can see my thoughts floating by, but I don't need to fight with them. I can look at my thoughts as, a, as opposed to believing them as the capital T truth. Um, especially for women that are postpartum that might be having kind of intrusive anxiety or fears about their baby's health. It can, mm -hmm. when you get confused with those thoughts, it can be really easy to believe that they're the truth. So um, for the therapists that are listening, you know, what you want to do is with your patients kind of encourage them to create some distance between their mind and the thoughts. So thoughts and feelings are not reality, right? You can kind of look at your thoughts, you can observe your thoughts. Um, some of the practices for cognitive diffusion involve imagining your thoughts are leaves floating on a stream or imagining if you guys have ever been to one of those sushi restaurants where mm -hmm. uh, you know there's the trays of sushi that are floating on the conveyor belt your thoughts and feelings are the pieces of sushi on the conveyor belt and you're just watching them go and you're not picking them up to eat them right you're not pushing them away you're just watching them um so i like to teach those strategies they basically encourage what's called psychological flexibility which is just a, a term that that acceptance and commitment therapy uses to sort of say, how can we reframe the way that we're looking at our thoughts and come from a place of curiosity as opposed to coming from a place of fear? Of course, if you have a, a client who is so stuck in this anxiety that it's affecting their functioning, that they're not able to take care of their baby, they're not able to go to work, they're not able to do the things that they need to do, that's when we know that we need to you know, seek an evaluation from a mental health professional and maybe they might need psychotherapy or they might need medication to take down the level of the anxiety. Thank you. Um, and for Lauren and Nika, I know the two of you have a private practice. Have you seen an increase in women coming in with anxiety as opposed to the depression piece? Lauren, do you wanna go first? Yeah, I, I've, I've noticed that there have been multiple women who've expressed more so um, feelings of depression um, and symptoms of depression, as well as an anxiety, but depression more so. And I believe a lot of what women are connecting to is the isolation piece. I think mm -hmm. they are connecting, having to be socially distanced. I think a lot of women or pregnant and postpartum women haven't been able to see family members, mm -hmm. which is really weighed on them. And that's the one thing in particular that I've been noticing. Absolutely. And we've definitely noticed that in our phone support program. A lot of people have said, you know, motherhood at times can be isolating to begin with. And during the pandemic, it's just magnifying. So absolutely. And Nika, what about you? I've actually been anxiety um, around adoptive parents, um. and uh, which I think people forget a lot about in parents who are people who are currently going through infertility, especially mm -hmm. during COVID because a lot of things stopped. They didn't know what would happen next. If you're mm -hmm. in the middle of an adoption, you don't know what's gonna happen next. You can't travel. Mm -hmm. And so I've seen an increase in that and an increase in fathers, which I think people forget a lot about as well. Absolutely, yeah. I mean, definitely paternal mental health is, is on the rise and it's starting to be a conversation that people are talking about. Um, Nika, so what, types of techniques do you give for that special population? Very similar to what we spoke of. Um, just kind of dealing and sitting with it. You know, I try to do some reality testing, right? How much of these fears and anxieties are based in reality? Um, yeah. And I try to just have some breathing exercises, tapping is something that works for a lot of my patients, if you know about that. Um, so it really is depends on the patient. Okay, thank you. Um, so now let's talk a little bit about medication because this is always a hot topic. Um, I know sometimes people are very apprehensive to go on medication, especially if it's recommended by their therapist. So Dr. Lachman, what are some quick little facts that you can give someone who, let's say, is a family support worker or a home visitation worker who's going in the home and 
the mom brought up to them that the therapist feels that they should go on medication, but they're on the fence. What are some quick little tips that they can say to try to get mom to be open to the idea of going on medication? Yeah, so I think that this is a really important topic just because we know there's so much stigma. Well, there's already so much stigma when it comes to mental health treatment, going to therapy, but taking medication if you're pregnant or you're breastfeeding is just a whole nother layer of, um, uh, has a whole nother layer of stigma and comes with its own uh, pressures as well. So um, one, I think it's important to remind clients that there are medications that are safe to take during breastfeeding. And the vast majority of antidepressants are actually um, very low risk to take. We do prescribe antidepressants during uh, breastfeeding. And um, if you have symptoms of depression or anxiety that are impacting your ability to get out of bed and go to work, impacting your ability to really be present and engage with your baby, those are actually going to come with their own consequences. Those untreated symptoms, so untreated depression, anxiety is considered an exposure as well. So we always need to be balancing the risk of exposing the baby to medication to the risk of not treating the illness. And so I think there, you know, you do have to be a little bit careful because you don't want to be shaming your patients. That's not our goal at all. Um, but I do think it's important just that the patient or the client understands that this is a choice that they can make and they can be empowered in this choice to take action around their mental health, to have themselves feel better. The other thing I like to say is that um, mom's mental health is basically the foundation for which the whole house is built. You know, this mm -hmm. isn't mom against baby. This is, you guys are a team. So anything that you do to help yourself feel emotionally uh, more stable and more grounded, that's only gonna be beneficial for a baby. Um, I know that Dr. Clark is gonna be talking a little bit more about medication, so I don't wanna go into too much detail, but I think, um, maybe one other piece is just the fact that medication works in conjunction with therapy. So it's not like just one or the other. If you're taking medication, that's gonna regulate how your brain circuitry is working so that yeah. you can go to therapy and you can learn all the skills that you need to learn because therapy is essentially learning, right? You're learning a new way to be, but medication helps you to be able to actually take in that information and then practice those skills. So it's not one or the other, they all go together. And Dr. Clark, I know that we're going to get into a more of an in-depth discussion with medication, but do you see a lot of women, if you present the idea of medication to them, being a little apprehensive? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I definitely think, uh, especially among Black women, it is... Um, I mean, again, it's back to that word stigma. Um, and it's also seen as a weakness, you know, like I, I should be able to pull myself together. I should be strong enough. Um, and, and I hate that word actually strong because it is been <laughs> this connotation historically for black women that um, has become equated to, um, you know, not taking care of themselves really being strong and doing all these things. Mm -hmm. So, so we have to discuss that. And I discuss that often with my patients. This is not about um, strength or weakness. This is about taking care of yourself. And if it was a heart attack or diabetes or any other illness, we would not be having this debate or this discussion about how long you should suffer with it before you get treatment. So mm -hmm. I, I put it in context that way. And then I and then I present to them, this is really about how also how long you want to suffer like this and how long you want to suffer in a way that also is bringing your baby consequences as well. Also maybe even impacting their livelihood, you know, their ability to work and bring home income, um, their relationship with their, their um, mates. So it, it can have very devastating effects to the family um, and just across the board. So I also present that to them. And at the end of the day, it is their decision. So I empower them to make the decision that they feel most comfortable with, supporting them all along with, okay, I'm here to keep giving you more education about this medication, about um, whether it's a good idea for you. Um, two weeks from now, I'll still be here. A month from now, I'll still be here. And if you decide at one point that you are tired of this and it's not getting better and you want to take this medication, I will support you through that as well. And I think that is so important. 
important that women feel empowered to do what they feel is best for them. And that that works really well when we're talking about medication um, as well as, and I do absolutely encourage, as Dr. Lakshman said, um, therapy and really starting there, especially for the person who is, or the woman who is apprehensive about medication. Let's get that therapy started. We can keep mm -hmm. working through this, you know. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Um, and I know that we talked a little bit about stigma. There's a lot of stigma for women in general going to get treated for perinatal mood and anxiety disorders because, you know, there's that motherhood myth that, you know, this is supposed to be the happiest time of your life and rainbows and butterflies. And we all know being in the field that that's not always the case. Um, so can, so Dr. Lakshman, can you talk a little bit more specifically about that stigma in terms of seeking treatment for women of color? Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, I can kind of speak from the my own, you know, personal experience as a South Asian woman. And um, I think when we were talking earlier, I was telling you that um, I've been getting more and more referrals from women who are Asian actually wanting specifically a psychiatrist or a therapist who also has that um, personal cultural experience. And I think there's some similarities um, with black culture as well in that in South Asian culture in particular, you know, women are the caretakers and also women are, you know, they're silent about their problems. Like you don't really talk about your struggles. You keep it private. It's, it's the idea of sitting with a stranger and sharing all of your kind of dirty laundry, so to speak, with a stranger is not something that is considered to be or you know it's not viewed kindly in south asian culture so i think that you know motherhood is an experience that is such a unique that's influenced by the culture that we grow up in in our family of origin and then our wider culture and i so i think that when it comes to the stigma of seeking help um this this i guess epidemic of silence that i see for women of color is something that really is compelling to me to think about sort of why is it that um, women feel that they need to just bear this burden like Dr. Clark was talking about you know how long do you need to keep suffering and and what why are you kind of feeling tied to that suffering and I, I think that there's fear you know there's fear that if I let go of that suffering that um, people are going to not being able to depend on me, you know, because as a caretaker in that role, there's just so much responsibility that falls on women's shoulders for women of color. So that's something that I talk about with my patients, you know, through therapy as well. Thank you so much, Dr. Lakshman. I really appreciate it. And now we're going to go on to our next speaker, Lauren Elliott. Uh, Lauren Elliott is an experienced public health entrepreneur, researcher, and trained journalist with over 10 years of experience in strategic communications and integrated marketing. She became an advocate for her mental health in addition to her physical health after an emergency delivery of her son and now dedicates her time to being the much needed advocate for other Black and people of uh, persons of color women at risk for mental health complications during and after pregnancy. She founded Candlelit Therapy to serve as an app-based mental health clinic where women can receive culturally sensitive behavioral health options, treatment, and resources. Thank you, Lauren, for being here with us this, uh, this morning, this afternoon. <laughs> um, Thank you. <laughs> um, so when it comes to Black moms, what are some of the problems and gaps that you see in your practice beyond physical health? Yes, um, it's uh, it definitely is a lot of what Dr. Lashman and Dr. Clark and Nika have mentioned of these barriers of um, burden of silence. And I know me personally, so I got pregnant with my son four years ago. It was three weeks after getting married. Um, so my son's a honeymoon baby and really experiencing milestone, like one milestone right after the other was overwhelming um, mentally and emotionally. And I wasn't prepared at all for parenthood my, and my husband either. Um, and, but during the time I didn't even kind of really embrace that. I just really tried to persevere. And I think uh, in a lot of ways, when I think about where the gaps are, I think it's not really having a pathway into mental health care. I know personally, 
um, I really liked when Dr. Clark mentioned having options because I felt um, right after having my son, uh, my pregnancy was relatively healthy. I didn't have uh, mental health care as an, an option at that point. I wasn't really see. I wasn't in in therapy like I'm, I'm, I'm in therapy right now. Um, mm -hmm. But what, once I had an emergency C-section with my son, I got preeclampsia. So I did experience like a bit of a comorbidity, right? And yeah. I, one, I didn't really feel like I got educated on what preeclampsia was at the time beyond just you have high blood pressure. Um, but I was told that I was going to be on like magnesium for 24 hours and I was going to be in a fancy room, right? So it's like, all right, you're going to have round the clock service from nurses. Um, but not once was I asked even. So there, there's really like this lack of a pathway to mental health care. So I wasn't screened in any kind of way or fashion of like, how are you feeling about this? What I've just shared with you by my healthcare mm -hmm. providers in that, in that context, which I really feel like I could have benefited from. And, yeah. and in a lot of ways, that's what I'm hoping to create with candlelit therapy is really making mental health care extremely accessible, um, normalizing, even seeking help to the point where you're trying to really identify your symptoms. I know what I ultimately did go through was postpartum depression, but I definitely didn't have the language um, at the time. And I definitely isolated myself. And I, it was interesting. I, I really attached, I really suppressed my, my what, what, what were symptoms of postpartum depression? I really suppressed very heavily and it was perpetuated through this generational strength and the, the whole black woman trope. Um, for me, it was specifically my mother telling me, you don't have time to be depressed. And it's such a loaded phrase. I still talk about it with my therapist today because it was told to me I was two months postpartum at the time. Yeah. Um, so I think there are a few different, there are a lot of problems and a, a, a good amount of gaps as well. But I think that access to quality care and culturally relevant care is a huge piece. That's a huge one. Oh, thank you so much for sharing your story. And it's interesting that you made, that you were told that comment by your mother, because that's something that through our emotional health phone support program that we're always told by a lot of our um, black moms is that, well, I don't have time to be depressed. You know, I'm so busy. And we even get that from our Hispanic moms as well. You know, so that's interesting. Um, so what aspects of candlelit therapy reflect your own experience as a mom? So I definitely have been extremely mindful of um, not only really having that that journey between identifying symptoms um, and connecting them to actual perinatal mood and anxiety disorders, having being like being educated about what PMADs are as a, a crucial piece. Um, and I notice a lot of times women and mothers, if they are shared or if they are encouraged to seek therapy, it's essentially like you should like you should go into therapy or you may need you may benefit from therapy, but then it's almost like it's left for the the woman, especially black women, um, to you know kind of fend for themselves as far as finding a therapist. A lot of black women I speak to definitely want to see a black female therapist. That's a huge priority for them, and it could be a deterrent in a lot of ways because there aren't many. <laughs> Black therapists in general, um, let alone psychiatrists. So I'm so happy to be on a panel with two um, that that you know that they have access to. So I, what candlelit therapy? Um, what I've really tried to put into it is this process of a screening portion, questionnaire portion, reimagining what that can look like for um, Black women and women of color, really down to the bare bones of like the questions that are being asked, um, mm -hmm. because studies have shown that depression and anxiety um, and the full kind of suite of mental health conditions really manifest differently in people of color. Um, it just hasn't been really applied, I feel like, really well. So that's in a lot of ways what I'm looking to do with candlelit therapy of really, um, and, and using a lot of the, the conversations I'm having in the process with candlelit therapy, the screening process to really inform how depression and, and mental health conditions do show up for different women, different racial and ethnic, ethnic groups, um, just so we can have that information and to better inform how we do um, patch women of color and um, that during their pregnancy, even as early as pregnancy, um, especially with postpartum periods too, once the child is born, really seeing how we can better um, bridge the gaps between patients and providers. Oh, that's wonderful. Wonderful. Um, so right now we are in a day and age where there's a lot of people that don't have insurance or are underinsured. 
So what do you do for those clients that fall into one of those two categories? Yeah, that's a that's a huge problem. I think um, the fact that so we've definitely looked at um, speaking with Medicaid and, and really kind of contracting with Medicaid. But I think because Black women in particular are disproportionately insured through Medicaid, I think a lot of this change and this shift in reimbursement of mental health treatment, which they are the they're like essentially they fund thirty five percent of an, um, the mental health treatment that occurs in the country, and then they fund nearly half of all births in the country, I think they are a major player um, in the conversation of coverage um, of mental health treatment and services, specifically for women who are insured through Medicaid, um, perhaps, but not privately insured. So I think as far as public insurance, there are a lot of shifts that need to happen in that case. And we're looking a lot in a lot of ways to bridge the, co the connection for uh, moms who are insured through Medicaid. For moms who are underinsured or not, like who just lack insurance entirely, I've really looked at um, covering covering expenses, essentially like fund, like paying for therapy sessions for mothers, um, especially in the first few months after having a child, um, when we know those are the very vulnerable weeks. Um, a lot of a majority of I think a third of deaths are occurring um, in that first year of postpartum after a child is born. We do know that a lot of mental health conditions kind of spring up in that period as well. But really looking at, because we're dealing with PMATs, we're dealing with perinatal mood and anxiety disorders, really looking at the full time period of during pregnancy and postpartum, um, how can a mom be protected? How, how can her insurance be protected or her health be preserved, whether she's insured or not? Because we all know that there's problems with um, Medicaid coverage, even for moms being um, losing coverage after 60 days after having their child which is a huge problem. And I, and I, I do love that there's um, a lot of ag advocacy groups who are trying to shift the, the narrative there. We're um, specifically, you know, encouraging that Medicaid cover moms at least up to a year postpartum. But yeah, that's in a lot of ways what we've been looking to do to help in that regard for mothers who, yeah, who, who need access, but, but lack the insurance coverage because we don't want that to be a barrier. No, we don't. And everybody deserves to get mental health services, regardless of what their, you know, financial situation is, or regardless of what their health insurance situation is, it's needed. Thank you so much, Lauren. So next, our next speaker is Dr. Clark. Dr. Clark is a board certified adult psychiatrist and an associate professor of psychiatry and behavioral health sciences with a secondary academic appointment in obstetrics and gynecology. She specializes in mood and anxiety disorders and is internationally recognized for her expertise in the treatment of women's mental health broadly across the lifespan. She is the current president of Marseille of North America, a premier perinatal mental health organization advancing research and care for the mental health of perinatal women and their families. Dr. Clark has been a contributor for several media outlets, including National Public Radio, The New York Times, Washington Post, Forbes, Atlantic, among others, and can be followed on IG Instagram at Dr. Crystal Listen. Mm -hmm. Hi, Dr. Clark, how are you? <laughs> I'm great, hello. It's wonderful to be here, wonderful to be uh, having this discussion with uh, this wonderful panel, so yeah. A very important topic. Absolutely. So we're going to dive back into medication because, again, that's one of the biggest things that always comes up when someone is seeking mental health services. Um, mm -hmm. Let's go into what are some of, I know Dr. Lakshman touched on this a little bit, but if you want to add to it, what are some of the benefits of medication? And also, how do you know when it's necessary for a patient to go on medication? Absolutely, great question. So, um, it's the benefit of medication. Um, there, there's several. One is again, I mentioned the time. There are some people who will eventually get better on their own, but mm -hmm. typically not. You know, a few weeks. This is like people who go through this for six months, eight months, and and gradually come out of it. And that's. But I see that as six or eight months in which 
that mother has lost time bonding with their child and that has been impactful on that child in ways that will only manifest developmentally later on and, and how they cope with um, emotions and, and anxieties as time goes on. So that, so the benefit is shortening that time to recovery for most women. Mm -hmm. Secondarily, um, we got to think about the fact that, you know, just because you feel depressed, maybe mildly one day doesn't mean you will stay that way. It can progressively get worse. Uh, we have people who can get so bad that they start to experience suicidal thoughts, I, or as we refer to ideation. And we know that there is a great risk for uh, maternal suicide in the postpartum period. So medication can help to prevent that, which is a, a major reason to take it. Um, so th those are the, the, the major two reasons that I encourage medication, or at least for it to be considered and educate about medication. Now you asked another question, Evie, and I forgot which one, that, what that was. <laughs> <laughs> um, when do you recommend, recommend them to patients? <laughs> Yes, so I, I recommended um, several reasons. So if I have a patient who has a history, for example, of um, depression or anxiety or bipolar disorder, um, and they have decided to forego medications, not something I recommend in pregnancy, but say they have decided that, and they wanted to see how it would go, and that's fine, that's their choice, but we see that the symptoms have returned. and. You know, with a history, that's a major risk factor for uh, symptoms returning in pregnancy and postpartum. I would recommend absolutely. Okay, we know that you have a history of this. You know, this is this pregnancy period with the fluctuation of hormones is only exacerbating that. We, you need to get back on medication. Um, someone who has a history of suicide, someone who has a history of postpartum depression. Uh, someone who has a family history um, of postpartum depression, their mom, their sister, um, you know, and their cousin have and grandma have uh, experienced this and now they're experiencing it. They're likely have a predisposition and are going to need medication. And most importantly, someone who's got more than mild symptoms. You know, we definitely know that therapy can be very effective for someone with mild symptoms and it, it might be effective uh, quicker uh, than you know, definitely quicker than not having any 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 type of treatment, but it can be quicker than someone who has a moderate or severe uh, mental illness postpartum. But someone who has a moderate or severe, that increases the risk of this getting worse, of there being um, poor outcomes such as suicide. And I find it critical for, you know, me to really educate those patients. You need medication. We need to intervene now uh, so that we can get you better sooner and so that this doesn't progress to a consequence that you know could have been avoidable and what would you say are some of the myths and stigma uh related to taking medication and how do you address that with your patients oh there are plenty oh. <laughs> i talk about this all the time because my patients um and I, I find this more so with women of color broadly, you know, whether they're black, Asian, Hispanic. <laughs> um, the fact that the, the medication might um, become addictive. And yes, there are addictive medications out there, but they're not antidepressants. Let me be clear. They're not mood stabilizers for bipolar disorder. They're not antipsychotics. They're, they are like Xanax, <laughs> which is not something anyone should be necessarily prescribing long-term for the main treatment of uh, a postpartum mental illness. So, you know, we have to have that discussion about the addiction potential, which there isn't any for these medications. Um, we also talk about it changing their brain like just changing their brain in a negative way. They, they're just fearful that it's going to, they're going to take it, it's going to disrupt their brain circuitry somehow, and they'll never be the same. And I have to remind my patients that, okay, you can take it. If you have an adverse effect, you feel weird, we stop it. It goes away. Whatever you experience will dissipate, will resolve. You will not be changed forever. You know, if anything, we hope that you are changed, meaning that you are uh, recovered from the symptoms you have and that those stay away forever, but it will not change the brain in a, in a harmful way. So that, that's another myth. And, and back to what I said really about, you know, just the cultural 
uh, myths and stigma around medication really being that, okay, well, somehow you're weak or this is you're doing something um, that you shouldn't have to do. You should be able to, you, you know, as uh, Lauren said, her mom told her, you know, you don't have time for depression. People say, their family tell them they don't have time for the therapy. They don't have time to take the medication. This is not something they should be um, investing their time in. They should be praying instead, visiting the pastor. And again, I bring it right back to the, okay, but when you go to the pastor, about the heart attack or the broken leg, you say yes, please. You know, I, I pray that I recover. I pray that um, my leg heals. I pray that my heart heals. And you go to the doctor and you get some medication and you get some treatment. We don't just pray and, and walk away from it. So, um, so I'm dispelling often those myths because people do bring that into my office. They bring that to the session. Well, I I believe in God. I'm, I um, I believe in my faith and my religion, and I'm just going to pray about it or, or worship in, in whatever way um, that they do. And I'm like, well, we're in the in whatever uh, religious, whether it's the, the Bible or Ron or, or what have you. I'm like, where does it say you're not supposed to treat your mental health? Mm -hmm. So so we I dispel those myths, myths as well. That's wonderful. And yeah, the religion thing is a big thing that I've been told too. But one of the ways that sometimes I've been I've spin it is well you know God gives people this ta these this talent to be able to prescribe you the right dosage and to get you the help that you need so I I've tried doing it that way as well um, yeah for those of you who are in private practice when you have approached medication to your clients what are some of the myths that they have told you aside from the ones that Dr Clark mentioned. Dr. Lachman, what are some, anything different from what Dr. Clark has said? Oh, you're muted. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, so no, um, I have heard a lot of the same things as Dr. Clark as well. You know, fears that I'm going to be addicted to this. I'm going to have to take this forever. This is going to change my personality. Um, you know, I think that that strong enough one, you know, like I shouldn't need this. I should yeah. be able to do this by myself is such a tough one for women of color. You know, there's a lot of guilt and shame, I think, that comes up with taking medication. And I just really wish that we could normalize it in the same way, like Dr. Clark was saying, if you break your leg and your surgeon says, we need to take you to the OR and do surgery, no one's going to be like, nope, sorry, I'm going to try and, you know, will this to heal on its own. Like, that's just not how we react. So why are we doing that when it comes to mental health? Um, I think that uh, those are some of the big ones, but I'd love to hear from you guys if, if you've heard different things from your clients. Nico, what have you heard from some of your clients? I think one of them that wasn't mentioned is the fear that you're going to be an unfit mother and they, you can lose your children. Um, I think when you're younger and you're, you know, you're living in the inner city and you don't have a lot of money, you know, people believe automatically you're unfit. You're more likely to be seen as unfit. So for a lot of women, they don't want to take medication for that reason. I'm now letting everyone know I need this medication to function. And now I'm at risk of losing my children. Thank you. It's and Lauren, have that mark against you. Yeah. And Lauren, what about you? What are any other myths or stigmas that you've heard when it comes to medication? For medication in a lot of ways, or even for medication and even for therapy as well, it's the cost of like what will be covered and what won't be covered. Mm -hmm. and, and there's this fear of like, I don't want to accept anything ex and, you know, unless I know, I think especially surrounding pregnancy um, and even postpartum, like I don't want to accept anything unless I know who would be responsible for paying. I think there's a fear of, um, Medical, like having a lots of medical bills and that being contributing to financial stress. Um, I know in communities of color, I mean, the financial literacy um, is definitely disproportionately impacts um, people of color, communities of color, but I know the financial stress is a big one. Um, I definitely know I personally experienced it when I had just, when I was in postpartum and I was on maternity leave um, and was not receiving an income and was dependent on my husband's income. I think the financial stresses are um, in addition to these other these other kind of uh, barriers, that's a that's a a stronger one. That's a strong one as well. And then you kind of see this this marriage of all of these 
um, barriers and stigma and it becomes, I don't want, I'm not going to engage at all. And then that's when we kind of fall into um, deeper into these conditions. Thank you. Um, okay. So when it comes to medication, Dr. Clark, a lot of people also too are apprehensive because of the side effects. They're afraid of what, of what the side effects are going to be. Can you talk a little bit about what are some of the common side effects of medication and what are some things that someone can do to avoid having the side effects? Yeah, so a great question. Um, there are definitely the potential for side effects. And I just remind people if it's something that persists and it lasts too long, again, this is reversible. It's not going to be something that's stuck with them for life um, because they've tried the medication. But some common ones are headache, um, GI upset, whether that's nauseousness um, or um, diarrhea, um, even constipation with some medications. Uh, feeling a little more agitated or dull. I, a lot of people tell me they're numbed, mainly the anxious patients who are taking that uh, antidepressant, which also serves to uh, treat anti or to be an uh, anxiolytic or against anxiety. It's they feel less anxious usually is what's happening, but they say they feel numb and they're just emotionless. And I'm like, no, I'm sure you can still cry. I'm sure you can <laughs> still. Uh, experience the full range of emotions, but initially that feels like a side effect to them. And so we, I think it's so critical to educate though, to forewarn that this may happen and then to talk about it when it does. I tell people that the side effects shouldn't be lasting more than a few days. So this is not something a month from now, you know, should be going on. And, and actually if it's going on beyond a week, we switch medications. And that's part of it, trying to find a medication that is uh, good for the individual. One size does not fit all, so we might have to have a couple of things that we try until we find something that a person is not having side effects on and that they're tolerating well. They should just be feeling like themselves, and that's what we aim to, um, you know, to make happen. The other really common side effect with some of the antidepressants is um, libido being down and sexual dysfunction. That's a major one I always remind women about because I mean, we, we should be having healthy sex lives too. So I don't want anyone to then be like, oh my goodness, now my sex drive is gone or I can't reach orgasm and now they want to get off the medication. So we try to um, think about that and I, I educate them about that early as well and their strategies around that. Um, but yeah, that's, that's a common one. And it doesn't happen with every medication. And it doesn't happen for everyone. It's not, you know, 100%, um, but it's something to look out for. Absolutely. And when, with these side effects, do they last the whole time? Like for example, with the headache and the diarrhea, do they last the whole time that the individual is on the medication or is it just for a few weeks until their body gets used to it? It's usually just a few days. Honestly, if it's lasting more than literally for me, if we hit like day six or seven and it's still there, we're going to switch medications um, okay. and move on. Else. We're not gonna. A doctor should not keep a patient on something where it's three, four months in. They're still like, I have this persistent headache. It's been there every day. You, you shouldn't be on that medication. Okay, thank you. So one of the points that Lauren had touched on was that she sees that a lot of black moms like going to a black therapist or a black psychiatrist. So mm -hmm. let's say that a black mom lives in an area where that. Um, that's not an option and they have to go see someone who's of a different race. What yeah. advice could you give to that person of a different race um, to how, what, what are some things they can do to help that black client? I have to remind people that, and to not take it personal, um, no matter what the background of the patient is, but especially with black moms, you have to remember that the data is showing us that Black moms are surviving more under the care of providers that look like them. So they're not dying after birth um, with, when they're under the care of the ob that looks like them. They're you know, less likely to die from suicide when they're under the care of the psychiatrist or mental health provider that looks like them. And that is the fear that Black mothers are having. They just want to live. You know, they want to have a good outcome. They want to be there for their child. They want to live to see their child. So I think addressing the elephant in the room, number one, mm -hmm. 
say that, you know, I'm aware that this is an issue. Um, and I'm aware that this may be an issue because non-Black providers are not paying enough attention, are not listening well, are not taking ser um, issues as serious for whatever reason. And that that provider should be willing to do exactly that, listen, um, investigate more, um, empower that patient to bring any concern to them and to respond to those concerns and, and make that a conversation that they have with the patient up front with that mom, with that black mother or, or mother of another background, any woman of color. Um, having those conversations up front and addressing the elephant in the room, I think will help the patient feel more comfortable and more empowered to share what's going on with them and more empowered to open up and be vulnerable and hopefully helps that provider to also be like, okay, I'm gonna pay closer attention and just investigate these different things because we know that it doesn't always show up the same. So just because a woman doesn't look like she's in pain, but she says she is, doesn't mean, oh, well, it's not that severe. No, it means you should investigate and see what's going on. Take that extra step and rule it out. So um, yeah, I just, I just think it shouldn't be taken personal. Really providers have to appreciate that the, the data is showing that something is wrong and um, we've got to all take better care of our patients, no matter where they, what their background is. Thank you so much, Dr. Clark. And last but certainly not least, we have Neka Finster, licensed clinical social worker. She is a therapist specializing in helping women and couples who suffer with perinatal mood and anxiety disorders, miscarriage, and loss. After years of working with people with all types of diagnosis, Neka decided to specifically work with perinatal diagnoses when realizing the huge deficit and mental health awareness and services for women who suffer from these disorders. In her work, she uses multiple techniques to best serve her clients, including cognitive behavioral therapy, motivational interviewing, interpersonal therapy, and mindfulness. She has almost two decades of experience helping families build and strengthen their relationships. Her past work includes supporting diverse patients in underserved populations, including inner city residents and LGBTQIA community. She also has an extensive background working with fathers, specifically utilizing the latest research to human behavior to help patients enhance their relationship with their children and increase positive communication and co-parenting efforts. She has received her master's in clinical social work from the Silberman School of Social Work at Hunter College and a Bachelor of Science in Sociology and Urban Education from the State University of Albany. She is clinically licensed in the state of New York and she is deeply involved in her community, serving as a member of the state and national professional organizations, including the National Association of Social Workers, National Alliance on Mental Illness, and the links incorporated. Hi, Neka, how are you? <laughs> Thank you so much for having me. Oh, you're very welcome. Thank you for being here. Um, so as social workers, one of the things that we're very big on is advocating for our clients, right? But sometimes we aren't able to do that and we need the client to be able to advocate for themselves. How can a black mother advocate for herself? So a couple of things, when I meet with patients or groups of people, I try to tell them first that it's a partnership. It starts with the relationship with the provider, like the doctor just stated, right? Mm -hmm. Being prepared, one, knowing your history, which was mentioned before, knowing your family history, knowing your medical history, knowing your family's mental health history. So really being knowledgeable about that. Secondly, not only looking for a hospital that's close in proximity, which was one of the first things people look at, but also doing the research, right? Looking at, um, you know, what the, what the, the, I'm sorry, what they have on the providers, you know, there are on a macro level, really quickly, I just want to say this, there are some policies where they're asking hospitals to show records of how many deaths by race and things like that. So looking into that, right? How many C-sections, how many, you know, vaginal births, Things, you know, 
what kind of birthing options do they have? Do they have more than one birthing option? So really interviewing your provider. I think, unfortunately, a lot of us get married to our providers. You know, yeah. we're not happy with them, but we feel like it's too much trouble to leave. And I really try to encourage my par my parents or potential parents to really, you know, see it as an interview process, right? Set up more than one appointment, you know, really try to figure it out. Outside of that, really knowing themselves, right? Are you someone who's currently struggling with your head just above water? You know, is this going to trigger you in a lot of ways? You don't need to wait until after you give birth to then decide you might want to get assistance. You might want to start being a therapist throughout your pregnancy. Um, mm -hmm. Identifying your community, right? Not only the community-based organizations, but who is in your village. What are the different roles in your village, right? My mom may be the person that will come and help me with the baby, but my mom may not be the person I want to talk to about how I'm feeling emotionally, right? Mm -hmm. So getting that list together, reaching out to your friends and saying, hey, can you be that person if I call you at 2 o'clock in the morning um, and I'm feeling stressed? A lot of times we put up our own barriers and we say people are too busy, they don't have time, you know. Yeah. And so kind of doing the footwork. Um, looking for therapists, not only Black, but people of color, right? Um, sometimes it, you might find someone who's closer in age that may make a difference. Mm -hmm. uh, where, where they're from, are they from New York City? If you're from New York City, that may make a difference, right? Um, doulas, utilizing someone else that can advocate for you. There are a lot of community-based organizations now that are, are offering low-cost doulas, right? Mm -hmm. um, so really trying to get your resources together the same way you would pack a baby bag, right? <laughs> you would pack everything to prepare, kind of set up this bag, right, of resources. Because as you know, when you're in it, it is very daunting to try to find, to find help, right? You're already stressed. You know, therapists can't call you back. They don't have any space. You feel defeated yeah. very easily. And so I say, what are the, you know, online chat groups that are available? Make a list. What are yeah. the, you know, people of color or black therapists that specifically work with this? Make a list. You may not need them, but if you mm -hmm. do, you've already done the research. Absolutely. That's great advice. Um, and can you talk a little bit about what is a perinatal mood and anxiety disorder? What does that look like in a person of color? It's, it can look it can look the same, but I think what people need to understand is that our baseline, and I think we mentioned this throughout the hour, our yeah. baseline is different, right? We're dealing with racism, discrimination. You have, you know, your cultural background saying, especially if you're a Black American, we've been mothers historically. You should be able to push through this, right? Oh, yeah. um, if you're going into, if you live in a certain neighborhood, your providers treat you a certain way. They automatically think that you don't understand your body. And so your baseline is already stressed and pulled. Mm -hmm. And so you may not look panicky, right? Like the doctor yeah. was saying. You may not appear as someone who's in distress, but are saying, I'm in distress, right? You may not have the vocabulary. You may just say, I don't feel right. And I think it's important for a lot of providers to know they may not say I'm depressed or I am anxious. I just don't feel comfortable in my body and I don't know what that means, right? So really not always having the vocabulary to describe how you're feeling um, is how it may look different than any other yeah. race. And can you talk a little bit about your private practice? Um, because right now we are in a, a maternal health crisis, a maternal mental health crisis, a maternal health crisis in general, especially for people of color. So can you talk a little bit about what you see in your private practice? So right now I see patients who are going through infertility. I see women and couples in all stages, right? Okay. Infertility stage or adoption stage, people who are currently pregnant, and those who have had a traumatic birthing experience or a perceived traumatic birthing experience, meaning that it just didn't look like what it thought, what it should look like. Yeah. Um, and so I work for Selene Institute, but I also have my own practice. I think what's great about COVID, hear me out, is that everything <laughs> is telehealth. And so I think because of that, patients have more access than they would have before. So if you don't have someone in your community that's a person of color, you wouldn't travel 30 miles. 
you know, but now it's online and you're not going to have access to that person because yeah. they're in state. So I think, you know, it's, this is really the time um, for people to get assistance, right? So that, and I try to work with people via sliding scale just mm -hmm. because, you know, it's really hard um, to see someone in distress and turn them away because they don't have the, the money to pay for the services that they need. Absolutely. Thank you. So, um, Neka, thank you so much for being with us for the past hour. Um, we do have time for one question. And Neka, this is directed to you. Um, how do you help people who have that fear that if they take medicine, they will be seen as an unfit mother? The thing about it is, a lot of time is who are you telling that you're taking this medication? Who are you announcing this, right? That um, this is your personal business. The same way if I'm taking medication for any other disease, I don't meet people and say, guess what? Look at all the medication that I'm taking. And so <laughs> I try to remind them that this is for you, for your best interest, for your family. You know, you're not at risk. You know, there is there's this idea that the hospital is automatically working with other agencies to identify that you're taking this medication, and that's just not the case. So really letting them know that the systems don't work together the way they think they do. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much. Once again, I want to thank all of our speakers being on our panel today, as well as those of you that are watching. It's great to see the professional com community coming together on this issue. We have so many people from all over the country watching today, and hopefully that will open some eyes on a national level and make people aware of how we can best support women of color and get them into services. At the end of the day, all women deserve to get help resources and the support they need and should never feel that they're going through anything alone regardless of your financial situation your race anything your gender your sexuality it should not matter and nobody should be suffering in silence so thank you all for being here once again, I'm going to say make sure to check out the Partnerships website at www.partnershipmch.org for upcoming virtual webinars to view the virtual support groups for pregnant and new mothers that are currently available. And just a reminder for you out there, this, will, this recording will be available on the Partnerships YouTube page, so please check it out and send it to anyone that you feel could benefit from this panel. Thank you to my panelists. Thank you to my audience and have a great day, everybody.